All right. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we will um, dive right in. I feel disconnected without having my camera on, at least for a second or two. So, uh, here we go. Um, so, uh, as I said um, just a few minutes ago, um, we are um, gathering ideas on how we can decrease that installation barrier. Uh, I'm going to leave the survey open while we're um, going through this next session, but I'm, I'm closing it right now here. Um, I did want to bring up, um, if I can find my window. Where is it? It's lost. There it is. Okay, um, so I did want to point out where we are in, in our agenda. Um, first off, can, please confirm someone can hear me and see my screen. I can hear you and see your screen. Okay. So um, we're at session um, nine, which is uh, going to be looking at how to analyze your MET plus output and then add flexibility to your workflow. But I did want to point out that we have also opened up a, a Google Meet session um, here as well um, to be running concurrently. Um, so if you feel that you want to um, be requesting help, um, you know, especially on compilation installation, that sort of thing, um, Julie Prasotnik, who just chimed in here, um, will be standing by. Um, feel free to go, go ahead and just meet her over in the, the Google Meet. Um, if you have other questions, that's fine as well. If she can't answer it, she will be letting, um, you know, the MET Plus team know um, that there's a question um, and, and someone will jump into the session to, to help you. So um, just wanted to, to give people an opportunity to, to um, get some help um, at a help desk if, if they desire. Um, so I'm, um, unless there's questions, are there any questions about that? Okay, then I'm going to dive into um, the first part of session nine, but I do want to recognize Keith Seawright, who just um, uh, flashed off the screen. Um, he's the one who's going to be um, uh, chairing our session and moderating and making sure that myself and others um, stay on time. Um, and uh, actually, I, I think that this one right here, we need to... Um, say that uh, Jeff Hamilton may actually be presenting. So now we're giving credit where credit is due. So Keith, are you are you ready to chair me on and, and keep me under control? That's right. So I will not give you a, uh, a two minute warning on your first introductory remarks since you're going into your next talk. So talk okay. okay. Thank you. It's all gonna kind of blend together anyways. All right, so as I said, um, uh, I'm going to be talking about um, how to analyze your data. Um, and I'm, I'm just briefly touching on some of this. Um, and then we're going to have other presentations um, that dive in a little bit more fully, um, as well as trying to increase flexibility um, through Python embedding. Um, we felt that those were topics that we wanted to spend a, a little bit of additional time on. So um, once again, I'm, I'm doing this on behalf of all the Met Plus team members. Um, and you know, thank you so much to, to them for all their um, Herculean efforts to, to bring this package um, to fruition. Okay, so first off, um, I, I, we, we haven't really covered this very, very much, um, is that there are analysis packages within the Met core set of tools. Um, I know we've talked about it a little bit, um, saying that these yellow bubbles over here on the right-hand side are focused on analysis. Um, and uh, in, in essence, um, many of these were developed prior to the instantiation of um, our Met Viewer database and display system that has now evolved into, um, you know, the underpinning Met CalPy, Met PlotPy capability and so forth. Um, but they're still very valuable tools, um, especially if you um, are wanting to do, just do some basic aggregation um, and you don't necessarily want to go into the world of Python. Um, so uh, starting from top to bottom, there is the mode analysis tool, which is 
focused on synthesizing mode attributes. Um, we do have uh, presentations um, embedded in our mode um, uh, trainings um, that we, we've done um, previously. Um, and um, there is a, a fair amount of description in the MET user's guide. So I'll point you to um, the MET user's guide for, um, for that uh, detailed information. And I'm not gonna go over it here um, once again in the interest of time. Uh, so um, for MET user's guide, um, let's see, I'm looking at what, chap what section it is. And MET user's guide mode analysis tool is chapter 19 in the user's guide. I'll update this presentation to have that information in it. Um, so the next tool that we have is stat analysis. And um, that is actually a, a pretty heavy workhorse um, for um, any evaluation that you're doing um, within MET or even um, at, at the MET Plus level, um, because it, it does have um, not only the ability to aggregate over multiple valid times or initialization times or lead times and, and use um, the metadata that's in the, the MET.stat um, output file, so that you can aggregate over things like masking regions or station IDs. And, um, um, and even if you have matched pair data, um, you know, this is the tool that will allow you to aggregate across matched pairs um, at the, the most basic sense. Um, you know, we have capability to be able to look for rapid changes in fields um, and then, you know, um, count those so that you can, um, you know, compute things like categorical statistics. But not only that, stat analysis has a lot of filtering um, capability that may um, be really beneficial um, for some pre-processing prior to doing some additional plotting and analysis. Once again, I'm not gonna go through um, all that capability. Uh, we, in the MET user's guide, um, stat analysis is covered in chapter 15. Um, we have um, examples of how to run it um, in our online tutorial. Um, and then uh, we actually have a section covered um, in it in, in the virtual training series that we just got done, um, you know, uh, giving between December and, and May of this year. Um, so I, um, I once again, I, um, I, I will update this with links to all of these different um, uh, resources, but um, just know that, that they are there and um, stat analysis can be a, a very powerful tool. Um, and our third analysis package, um, RMW analysis, um, is, uh, was developed um, to complement a, a tool that we haven't really talked much about at all, which is TCRMW, which um, was developed to replicate um, a diagnostic um, uh, capability coming from um, the National Hurricane Center and CIRA. Um, and uh, at the moment, the diagnostic package um, escapes me. Sorry about that. Um, anyway, uh, but to, to be able to um, do the analysis aspect of it and really look at, um, you know, model diagnostics in terms of, uh, for tropical cyclones, in terms of radius and maximum wind space, um, the RMW analysis tool is, is what is um, uh, recommended. And um, RMW, um, the analysis tool is in section um, uh, chapter 26 of the user's guide. Um, and then finally, we have um, TC stat, which is also, you know, um, down here in the bundle with the tropical cyclone um, evaluation um, focused um, tools. And similar to stat analysis, it will um, work with the, the TC related um, that stat output. It will aggregate over multiple valid and lead times, and it'll use masking regions and station ID and distance from land, and and you know lots of metadata that is included in the the dot stat output um, to help with stratifying your your um, computation of statistics um, and so forth. And same thing, it, it um, has the capability to identify rapid changes in field, which within the world of tropical cyclones is, um, you know, called rapid intensification or rapid, um, you know, um, weakening um, and so forth. So um, TC stat is yet another um, powerful tool, um, definitely um, one of the workhorses of, of um, you know, the whole MET core set of tools. 
Um, and same thing, um, it's in my user's guide. It is in chapter 24 of the user's guide. Um, we do have um, an online, um, a section on, in the online tutorial on how to run it, as well as um, a specific section in the virtual training series. Um, so those, those are um, our analysis capabilities within MET itself. Um, <coughs> and you can use those without um, installing any of the MET Plus wrappers or using any of the other uh, MET Plus components. Um, just really quickly, do we have any questions <coughs> um, regarding, regarding that? And I can't seem to find my um, chat window right now. So um, if someone can let me know if there's something. Nothing yet. Okay. Um, okay, so moving on. You've already seen this diagram a couple of times and, and this is actually where much of the focus this afternoon is um, going to be is on, on the um, analysis tools that are more Python-based and, um, and um, database-driven. So, um, you know, in this diagram, you know, it's showing how all the, the inputs come into MET and then, um, you know, how the, um, the data are um, made available um, to these other applications. Um, with a, a focus on initially, um, MET Viewer was developed um, to be able to um, store data in a database um, and then have a user interface to be able to um, query the data, do deep dives, you know, really um, dig into analyzing the data. Um, uh, a few years later, um, MetExpress was developed um, because there was an expressed desire to have um, a user interface that, um, that, it, that was a little bit um, less complicated, a little bit um, easier to just, you know, point and click a couple of things and then um, have a plot, um, something that could be used more by managers and um, congressional staffers and, and so forth. Um, so that's um, where MetExpress comes from. Um, and it, it has um, more like pre predefined queries and predefined plotting, even though the plotting is interactive. So we have these two user interfaces. Um, and then um, over the past couple of years, um, we've been evolving away from um, the R statistics package, which we had been using and, and transitioning over to Python, trying to put together this more cohesive um, Python, you know, related um, framework um, around um, the MET uh, tools and then, um, you know, these user interfaces. Um, so, uh, then we also, you know, have a, the utility MET data DB. Um, which um, handles loading of data, but has also started acting in a way of um, being able to do other um, I.O. Um, procedures like reading that CDF files um, and, and so forth directly. For example, the MET, um, um, uh, MET CDF files and, and so forth. Um, I, I believe Minna yesterday men mentioned that um, MET DataDB is going to be soon renamed in um, the upcoming version of, of MET Plus um, to MET Data IO to reflect this transition away from only supporting database loads, but also, um, you know, uh, performing other utility um, reading IO um, procedures. Okay, so um, just to show you a little bit of evolution, um, MET Viewer, which once again was the, the, um, the core analysis tool and then still is the core analysis tool for the Developmental Testbed Center, as well as um, um, EMC for um, some of their model development work that they're doing. Um, you know, it, it, took, it takes in both MET output as well as a legacy um, format for EMC. BSTB, which st stands for Verific Verification um, Statistics Database. Those are loaded into um, a database. Um, there is a configuration file that's in XML that um, drives um, the, the calls to the database, as well as the, um, the, um, the generation of the R scripts to generate plots, as well as scorecards. Um, there's the web interface, as well as the batch engine. The packages um, are Java, um, some version of a relational database that is a flavor of MySQL. Um, and then initially it was R scripts and then, you know, Tomcat, which is part of the web application um, part of this. 
So um, over the past uh, two releases, we've been moving kind of away from our scripts um, and trying to, to move into Python. Um, and what that has done is it's um, introduced, um, we're moving towards using YAML for our configuration language. Um, and, uh, and, and while still trying to support the R scripts, um, just so that we have some overlap um, and, and redundancy so that we can do some testing, make sure that we're still generating the plots the same way and so forth. And what we're moving towards um, for MetViewer 5.0.0, um, which is, you know, going to be at the same time as the Met Plus 5.0 release. Um, is our statistics is gone, um, and then we're working um, solely with MetCalcPy and MetPlotPy. So MetCalcPy and MetPlotPy are, are going to be sophisticated um, packages that, that can not only support these um, the user interface for MetViewer um, and, uh, and eventually MetExpress uh, um, as well, um, but also be run on the command line um, so that you can have the same um, uh, statistics computation, regardless of whether you're using a user interface or, or a command line, you can have the same plotting, regardless of whether you're using a user interface or command line. So that's that's the goal, is to have as much consistency um, and yet flexibility as possible. So this is MetExpress, um, and this is what we're moving towards. You'll notice that um, MetExpress um, doesn't necessarily have quite as much um, configuration um, required. Um, and uh, it, it is in transition to uh, also depending on MetCalcPy, and then it uses Plotly as its plotting, um, which provides interactive plotting capability. So in essence, what is um, highlighted um, up at the top is what is shared between MetViewer and MetExpress. Um, and then, um, you know, what is different is um, the look and feel of the web interface um, uh, necessitated by trying to have things as streamlined as possible. MetExpress and then um, the plotting. Okay, and then um, one final note, um, because this is not only talking about this MetPlus um, analysis suite, but at the end of this session, um, we're going to have Dan Adrianson, one of our um, scientists who's, who's done a lot of work with Python embedding, um, talking about how to add um, Python uh, flexibility through Python embedding. And, and basically, um, what that means is if you have, you know, um, uh, data that MetPlus doesn't support, um, your input data, um, or if you would like to derive fields that are currently do not exist in your model output, we saw an example from um, Nick Leonardo earlier today uh, of using um, Python embedding to derive, um, you know, do new diagnostic fields and so forth. Or say, for instance, you need to rescale your field, um, uh, your model field or your observations or do summations over observations or, you know, something like that. But it's something that's not supported by MetPlus. Um, you can use Python embedding. And basically what this is, is um, the uh, with the right configuration flag, um, GridStat or any of the other tools knows that it needs to look to Python embedding to be basically the ingest operator for um, either, you know, gridded files um, coming into it or um, grid analyses in that CDF format or, um, you know, observations in ASCII or net CDF format or, or in HDF5 or, you know, whatever it is. So this is where the flexibility comes in. So um, that uh, basically is um, an overview of the MetPlus um, analysis suite. I do want to just um, cover um, in, in a brief few couple of minutes um, MetViewer itself, and then um, after this, um, we'll hear about Met, um, Met Express and then move on from there. So MetViewer, um, this is what the user interface looks like. Um, you can, um, you know, uh, pick from a, a series of uh, different um, plotting templates, whether you want to plot temp, um, time series or box plots or bar graphs, histograms, frank histograms, um, you know, some of the um, different uh, uh, probabilistic and, and ensemble-based um, statistics. Um, you pick your variables, the models, um, what kind of um, data, how you want to stratify the data. Um, it, so all of that is flexible um, and gives you a lot of uh, ways to, to look at the data. You can configure the plot area, um, you know, the formatting, the X, X and Y value, um, axes, labels, and, and legends, and so forth. 
Um, you can um, you have control over the line colors um, and how thick they are and what symbols you use and and um, what um, the title of the line is, you know, what the legend text is and, and so forth. And then you hit um, generate plot and then it plots something up in the upper right hand corner. Um, Mina covered most of these, but once again, just to refresh your memory, um, these are all the different plot templates. And just um, for those who have yet used MapViewer in the past, um, uh, because we're in this transition between R and Python, um, you can um, uh, right now use Python is the default setting, um, and um, and you can uncheck that if you want to um, do a comparison to what um, is generated with R, so that you can um, do a, a sanity check and make sure that we haven't broken anything um, in the transition. So. Um, <clears throat> Contour plots is another um, type of, of plot. Um, we see these a lot um, in, uh, especially S2S diagnostics, where you have um, some some um, you know type of measure across the x-axis. In this case, it's forecast lead versus height, and then you um, in the contours is the um, you know the values of um, in this case temperature bias or, or something like that. So it's kind of it gives you three dimensionality to your to your data. Um, th these are, you know, some of the, the um, different plots that are available for ensemble and probability. And then um, synthesis diagrams, so things like performance diagrams, um, which uh, I, I, at least I saw in Tina Kelb's um, presentation earlier today, and scorecards. Um, you know, and, and not only um, can, is it, you know, a specific color combination of reds and greens, which are not all that great for people who are colorblind, um, you can specify the different color combinations as well as the symbols that are used in the level of, of um, you know, detail, whether you want to have um, one or two or three different um, statistical significance levels and so forth. Um, things like Taylor diagrams and revision series forecast consistency, which was presented by Tracy Hertnecke um, earlier today as well. Um, I, I already talked about being able to fix values. Um, I, I did want to point out that there are two different ways of computing your statistics. You can either calculate mean, the mean statistics, you know, across, um, you know, uh, whatever uh, aggregation period you'd like. Um, you get different answers when you calculate mean statistics rather than aggregating statistics from their base values. Um, an example is precipitation. If you're, um, you know, computing mean statistics of um, equitable, equitable threats for Gilbert skill score um, across daily values, you will definitely see a difference um, than if you go um, to the, the um, core contingency table counts, which handle correct nulls. Um, you know, more appropriately um, and, and um, you know, times when there is zero precip. Um, and so you'll, you'll see a difference in the scores. So, so there are um, the ability to, to compute scores um, two different ways in that viewer. Um, there is the ability to look at the history of plots. So you can go in and, and you know, look and see um, what kind of um, plots have been made and, and um, it, it's great for sharing. Um, templates and, and configuration files for, for plots because you can also download um, the XML specification for that. Um, you can also save your plots um, out to, you know, um, to have it available for including presentations or publications, um, as well as saving, once again, that XML configuration file so that you can um, save it for later, upload it um, back into um, the user interface, share it with someone else, say, here's how I made this plot, um, and so forth. You can also save the data so that you can do additional analysis if you wish. Um, this is where you would load um, the XML configuration plot back up into this user interface so that you can modify it to, to get, you know, the next plot that you would like. Um, and then there's uh, the ability to add in, um, like, pairwise differences um, uh, when you're doing aggregation Many times you may want to um, uh, compute um, differences on a, on a um, lead time by lead time or valid time by valid time basis so that you're, um, you know, uh, handling those, those model differences correctly, um, you know, right at, the, at um, each um, given um, validation time. So we do have that um, ability here. Um, and, and what that does is it gives you the ability to um, Compute the pairwise differences, apply things like bootstrap confidence intervals, 
um, but also um, to um, uh, uh, plot the, the pairwise difference um, uh, with um, the ability to bold um, where, where there are statistically significant differences. So in other words, where the confidence intervals do not cross um, the, the zero difference line. Um, so this is, is nice for identifying where there's statistically significant um, uh, information um, in, your, in your statistics. So I just want to wrap up really quickly. Um, if anyone is interested in, in you know, exploring that viewer, um, we do have an instance available through the DT Center um, website. Um, uh, you can go in, um, you, you know, um, there, there is a, um, a training once again in the, um, the virtual training series as well as the online tutorial to get you started. Um, the data sets may or may not make sense to you because they're there for DTC um, purposes, but you're welcome to explore. Um, always make sure that when you're using the Met Viewer um, user interface um, to select a database, um, the plot type that you're looking for, the um, variable, in other words, the Y um, dependent variable, um, you know, what, what kind of lines you want to put on it, um, the X axis or the independent variable, how you want to aggregate the statistics, and um, whether you want to compute a mean or a median to be plotted if you're um, if you're using um, summary measures and so forth. Um, and uh, if you're interested in, in um, learning how to install um, MetViewer, um, we also have that information available um, on, on our MetViewer website and in our user's guide. So with that, I will open up questions on um, either MetPlus analysis um, suite, um, of which many of those might be answered in the next couple minutes, um, or on MetViewer itself. Very good timing, Tara. So we have time for a, a few questions before we go into the next talk. Um, I don't see any at the moment. This might be a good opportunity for all of you out there who use MetViewer to, uh, to uh, mention what features that you use that you like the most, or perhaps something that's missing, a new kind of plot or plot options. If there's anything like that, this is a good opportunity to advocate for that. So. Any questions or comments from the group? Those of you in Colorado are probably uh, half asleep from lunch, so that's uh, perfectly understandable. So Tara, I don't know if you have any thoughts about this, but um, we have a, a the 500 coming out. Are there any particular new kinds of plots or new, new features that uh, are in the interface that uh, might be of particular interest to the group. Do you, do you uh, have any that you want to mention? Um, you know, we, we haven't really talked about adding in any new plots. We, we have, as I mentioned before, taken um, kind of a, a sizable um, hit on some funding. And so we're, we're right now kind of scrambling to try and um, identify what we will and will not be able to, um, to include in, in 5.0. Um, we will have full, fully transitioned over to Python. Um, uh, assuming that some of our um, our ideas uh, are approved by um, the DTC management board, um, we should be um, hopefully adding in um, some additional ability to um, uh, look at data, um, look at the plots in um, in more of a web-like interface to um, you know to view all the large inventory of data, um, things that are not typically going to be included in EBS. Um, and there are definitely some other plots that I would love to see um, transitioned over to, to MetViewer, including um, uh, uh, like uh, uh, what am I looking at? I'm I'm trying to say scatter plots and. Um, uh, you know, QQ plots and, and so forth that, that should be fairly easy to, to, um, to work towards adding. I'm, I'm just not quite sure if it's going to happen by 5.0 or if it will have to, have to happen in 5.1. Look, it sounded like a question or a hand got raised. So we have a, uh, a question in the chat. Can you see the chat or should I read it? No, I can see it now. So can the viewer be developed into a Docker container for pull conversion into a singularity container um, on the HPC. 
Um, so I am not the person to answer that. I know that um, NRL is using um, Singularity, and I know that we've been doing some work on trying to um, to have MetViewer um, in a Singularity container. But I am actually going to defer to maybe like a like um, John HG or Tatiana or George or someone. Can someone chime in here? Sure, Tara, I'll chime in. Um, and I don't. I don't think Tatiana is on the call right now, but if she was, I would ask for, for her input. Um, so um, a recent, okay, so the challenge with um, with MetViewer in a Singularity container is the that we use Docker Compose. You know, we, we do use it in a Docker container and run it that way. Um, and we use Docker Compose to launch it in coordination with the, a database image. Um, with singularity uh that that the there was there there used to not be a singularity compose option and now there is so um on this other containers project that we've had um michelle harold who i work with who presented earlier today um has uh, made great progress on getting metviewer to work through singularity and michelle if you're on please jump in and, and make a comment but um john i think what would what would be useful is you could you could post this question in a discuss in a Met Plus discussion, and then I can um, refer you to Michelle with more with more information. Thanks, John. Appreciate um, it, John. So we we have one more quick question we can get in. Um, it's in the chat. Yeah, can Met you regenerate Taylor diagrams? And the answer is yes. That's a. Very concise answer. Very good, appreciate that. If you have more questions and comments, please put them in the chat and, and uh, Tara and others will be able to see those. So let's go ahead and go to our next speaker. So the next topic is Med Express, And I believe that Jeff Hamilton is going to give the presentation today. And Jeff is over at uh, NOAA GSL as is Molly Smith. Um, who who may be here as well. So whichever of you has decided to give the talk today, if you would like to go ahead. Um, Tara, are you presenting the slides? I didn't realize I needed to, but I can. Oh, no, I can present, Tara. It's no problem. Okay. Either way. Well, I know Julie's, Julie's in the help, help desk, so I thought I'd ask. Let me just see if this will work before I say that I can. All right, can everybody see that? Looks good. If you're not in present mode, now you are. Very good. Yep. Perfect. All right. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Jeff Hamilton, and I'm actually filling in today uh, for Molly Smith to talk about the MedExpress web interface. So, fortunately, she's uh, fighting a lost voice right now, but uh, I believe that she is on the call to um, answer any questions that may come up in the chat and, uh, and afterwards as well. So uh, in the meantime, though, I'll do my best to uh, highlight the great work that she and the Medic Met Plus team have done uh, with this interface. So first, uh, a bit of background on the motivation behind the development of MetExpress. It is uh, one of two web-based visualization tools available to Met Plus users, the first being MetViewer, the presentation that uh, Tara just gave. Uh, MetViewer is an extremely powerful and uh, comprehensive tool for assessment. Um, however, we, uh, we found over time that users had difficulty navigating such, such a system, uh, especially during the first attempts to use it. Um, so scientists from the DTC and uh, NOAA's Global Systems Laboratory came together as part of the UFS project and developed MetExpress as a lightweight visualization suite that didn't have the uh, steep learning curve of the more powerful MetViewer. Um, with this approach, we, we lose some functionality, but we also make things a lot easier for users to uh, quickly create commonly used interactive graphs uh, from the same MySQL database that MetViewer uh, uses as well. So this is the home page for MedExpress, and uh, as you can see, the interface consists of individual apps. Uh, each is designed to tackle specific meteorological phenomena. Uh, up to this point, we have developed eight applications, but uh, we certainly have the capability of adding more in the future as uh, needs arise. 
So now we're going to go over each of the uh, apps individually, and we'll talk about some of the, the differences and commonalities between them. So first, we have the Met Upper Air application. This app handles scalar and vector statistics for three-dimensional fields on isobaric levels. Uh, it currently includes six selectable plot types you can see here. We have time series, profile, die-off, valid time, histogram, and contour plots available. And uh, the, the, uh, the current selectors that you see there uh, are set up for the time series plot type. We'll go into that now. Oh, I take that back. We're not. The, uh, there are selectors across all the different uh, plot types. Um, as you can see, some of them are, are specific to its respective plot, but many are, are common between them. And for this specific plot that we see, this is an upper air time series example. And we have selections that will create a series for a 24 hour forecasted GFS uh, 500 hectopascal temperature RMSC over the full global domain of the model from May 23rd to June 23rd of this year. And uh, I should note that all of these selectors that you see here are uh, dynamic. They're derived from metadata scans inside the MySQL database and then are loaded uh, when the app is starting. Once you have the uh, desired selections, you'll, uh, you'll add the curve and then a, uh, a plot selection will come up once the curve is added up here. And this is what uh, comes up. On the site itself, uh, this graph would be interactive, meaning that you could zoom in and out and also hover over these points to sp display specifics regarding that point, such as the time that it's valid at, uh, the, the actual statistical value, and uh, a number of other things, depending on what plot type you're actually looking at. Um, additionally, you'll, uh, you'll see a number of control options up at the top of the page in blue here. Uh, these provide the user with, uh, with customization of the graph, including changing the, the curve styles, the axis ranges, the caching options, data lineage, which is really just looking at the query that actually produces this plot. And, uh, and a whole lot more. Um, this area's capabilities are, are really always growing uh, as we get more and more requests uh, for different ways of tinkering with the curves once it's actually plotted here. So here are some examples of uh, additional upper air plot types, um, many of which will be replicated in the other apps we'll talk about here soon. Uh, you have profile plots that aggregate statistics over time and display the statistical value in relation to the isobaric vertical coordinate. Uh, Die-offs are very useful um, in analyzing skill as a model progresses through its forecasts. Um, valid time provides users with insight into skill at different times of the day. Uh, histograms allow a user to see the uh, spread of the statistics for a forecast over a given selected time period, uh, a month in this case. Uh, and contour plots provide the capability to see how a statistic changes in relation to two input variables instead of one, uh, both of which are actually selectors that users can choose when creating the contour plot type in MetExpress. Now we'll uh, quickly move through the other apps available uh, in the interface. And here we have the Met Anomaly Correlation app, uh, which was, as you would expect, displays anomaly scalar and vector statistics from the Met Plus output. Um, this app includes the same plot types as the upper air, upper air app we just discussed, which comes as no surprise. Uh, we have Met Surface. Uh, this displays scalar and vector statistics for variables on surface levels. And uh, these are distinguished from the three-dimensional variables during the uh, database metadata scans. It's only on surface levels that are picked up and that this app loads. The plot types are, are pretty identical to the upper air and on the correlation apps with the exception of the profile type for obvious reasons. So next we have the Met Air Quality app. Um, this displays scalar statistics and contingency table skill scores for air quality fields on surface levels. And all of the plot types found in the surface app are included here with the addition of the threshold plot type. Um, this plot this plot type places the uh, thresholds defined in the MetPlus configuration files on the X axis and then plots the statistics for them. And uh, you'll notice as we, uh, as we keep going here that you're going to see a lot more functionality and complexity of these apps. And, um, and the Met precipitation app uh, certainly continues that trend. Uh, here we display 
scalar statistics, contingency table skill scores, economic value, and uh, fraction skill scores for precipitation fields. Uh, the six plots from the up from the air quality app uh, are found here uh, with the addition of uh, grid scale plots and uh, very similar to the, the threshold plots you saw with air quality app, uh, the X axis on these plots are defined by the grid scales that are found in the uh, configuration files as well. So the, the Met Ensemble app is probably the most unique out of all the applications in MetExpress. Um, this app displays ensemble statistics and uh, probabilistic statistics for various fields. Um, and uh, these vary by plot type, which I'll get into now. Uh, eight different plot types are included, four of which we've seen before, which are time series, die off, valid time, and histogram. Um, but ensemble has four of its own, uh, which really aren't replicated anywhere else. And those are the ensemble histogram, the reliability curve, the rock diagram, and performance diagram, uh, which we'll go into now. So these are examples of those four plot types. Uh, reliability plots uh, produce a curve for probabilistic variables, uh, really one at a time compared to observed relative frequency. Uh, four additional lines are on display as well. Uh, and these are common to any of the reliability diagrams you'd normally see. Uh, you have some denoting perfect skill, no skill, and uh, X and Y axis climatology. Rock curves are produced from a, prob a probabilistic variable as well. Uh, with probability of detection and false alarm rate on the X and Y axes. And the diagonal no skill line is included in there as well. The ensemble histogram plot type is actually, it's really three plot types in one. Uh, it includes a histogram type selector uh, on its main page to specify the type of histogram to plot. And there's three different options available to it. Um, and all are derived from the ensemble stat met plus utility. Uh, there's rank histogram, there's probability in integral transform histogram, and relative position histogram. And uh, finally, we have the performance diagrams that display multiple probabilistic variable curves, and so not just one on this one. And uh, they're displayed against success ratio on the x-axis, uh, POD on the y-axis, as well as the solid curve lines of constant bias and the dashed lines of constant CSI. So now we have the uh, first of the two most recent additions to MetExpress. A Met Cyclone was added last year and uh, was designed to look into statistics specific to tropical and extratropical cyclone activity. Um, there are additional selectors available on this app uh, that allow for analysis of specific basins, uh, seasons, and even individual storms. Um, and you can see those, see those in this area right here. So there's plot, there's five plot types included. Uh, there's time series, die off, valid time, and histogram, all very familiar. And there's also a new year-to-year -year plot that is specific to this app. Uh, this plot produces yearly average time series, which are very useful when comparing the forecast skill over specific seasons for a given model. So you can look at you know 2020 versus 2021 uh, aggregated over an entire year. Uh, finally, we have the, the Met Objects app uh, that was just added to MetExpress earlier this year. Um, it was designed to display object-based statistics and skill scores uh, for various fields generated by the Met Plus mode utility. Uh, you'll see that uh, there's five plot types that are included, uh, all ones that we have seen before, time series, die off, threshold, valid time, and uh, histogram. So I know that that was a, a quick overview of all the, the different MetExpress apps, but uh, really feel free to try the interface out for yourself online at the uh, the following URL. This installation specifically uh, resides on a AWS instance in support of the UFS project. Uh, so you'll find data from a variety of sources when experimenting with the applications. And additionally, if you're interested in learning about any of the apps functionalities on a, a deeper level, since we did quickly go through them here, um, please look into that at the, uh, the MetExpress user's guide that's available on the MetPlus website. It's a really detailed reference on how each app works, all the plot types that are available to you, and even uh, kind of a rundown of the statistics that are available as well. And uh, that's all I, that I have. Um, thank you for your time and be happy to take any questions that you may have. And I'm, I'm sure Molly could answer some as well in the chat. So thank you. Very good. Thank you, Jeff. So we do have time for questions. 
So I don't see any in the chat yet. Uh, feel free to raise your virtual hand if you have a question or if you want to type it into the chat, that's, uh, that's great. Um, and Alicia has a question. Hi, um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little more about Met Cyclone. I, I might have missed it. Of course, I have like, there's all kinds of crises today. Um, is that you need to have Cyclone tracks already and that's available to you it's not doing it from like raw forecast files right correct you'll need the the a decks and the b decks from what i understand uh so you you'll definitely need the the observations uh from uh nhc uh in addition to the forecast tracks from the model and molly okay. can certainly correct me if yeah. i'm wrong about any of this <laughs> I, I just had two cough drops and a mug of tea so i'm gonna try this <laughs> but um yeah, so you do need track files. You don't have to use the NHC BDEX if you don't want to, but most people prefer them as, as truth, and you run both of those through TC pairs and MET, and, um, <clears throat> sorry, you get, uh, yeah, you get TC pairs output and load that into your, your MET database, and then MET Cyclone can display it. Okay, thank you, Molly. I You, you probably... You know me, so you can probably guess that I was thinking more about the extratropical cyclone aspect of it. And I was like, oh my gosh, is there some kind of magic pill that we can use to make do extratropical cyclone verification? But um, yeah, it I sounds mean, like I'm we not need to... <laughs> specifically sure what I, I have seen people produce track files for, for extratropical cyclones and verify that. Like, I've seen it yeah. done. I don't know how it's done, but we, we do display uh extratropical statistics in met cyclone um although yeah like I, said, I haven't done that in just myself oh that's fine thank you very much i appreciate it we've got a number of questions in the chat now one of them uh well there's more than one so there are questions on connectivity to these links that we were given um specifically the met express link is not working for for someone um, and there's a question about VPN. So I know you can access the Met Express without being on a VPN. Oh, uh, well, leave off the www. I'm, I'm sorry, they got rid of that recently and I forgot to update the slide. So so James, try it now and, and see if it works for you. And I don't oh, know- that It to has to be HTTPS as well. I'm, they just did a bunch of server stuff earlier this year and I forgot to, I forgot I to update it, I'm sorry. And, and SK had a question about Met Viewer. So, do we have any specific security to get into the Met Viewer link that Tara had? Uh, Does that just work, or do you need to be? Yeah, no, it should, it should work. And, and I mean, the question about whether um, you can use Met Express and Met Viewer outside of NSEP or UCAR VPN network, the answer is. Um, yes, you could install it on your own um, system and, and use it locally um, as needed. Okay, there's a DTC. Like, thanks, thanks for that, John. Mm -hmm. Let's see, a few more questions. So I see the one about the user's guide. So that looks like an old link. We have a, an updated user guide. Um, that's uh, reachable off of the, the DTC dtcenter.org site. So you can find the most recent link to the user's guide there. I don't remember what version we're, we're on. It's 4.4 or something like that. Um, let's see, we have a question about Plotly. Is there a way to use the Plotly part without installing the web GUI part? No, not at the moment. We want to do batch mode later, but we don't we don't have it yet, so sorry. Uh, a question to those that are working on Met Plotpy as part of, you know, the the full suite and Met Viewer. Um, I, I know that we're using Plotly for some of our plotting. Um, is that correct? That, that yeah, that is correct. Uh, wherever possible, uh, for some of these plots, like the rock diagram, there are some things that Plotly does not support. So sometimes those. Uh, we have to re resort to developing in Met, Matplotlib. And then, of course, um, some of our contributed plot, a lot of our contributed plots are written in Matplotlib as well. Okay. I 
think I got all of them out of the chat. We had a good conversation going. If I missed any of the questions in the chat, feel free to repost them or raise your electronic hand. Okay, I think we are at time. So again, if you have additional questions or comments, please put them in the chat at any time. And we'll go on to our next. And this is a combination of several things. Met CalcPy, Met PlotPy, Met DataDB. And Minna Wen, it looks like you are our speaker. Yes. So, um, so you get to listen. You're with uh, uh, and Carrell, and you're one of the authors of a lot of this stuff. So take it away. Okay. So Hank is uh, unavailable. He's lost his voice. So a lot of folks have lost their voices. So you get to listen to me for the entire entire talk. Um, so let's make sure everything is. All right. Let's get rid of that thing. Oops. All right. All right. How is that? Can you see everything? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm going to talk about the three components, the not the, the not web interface part. So it's the back end, the back side of the house. So data DB, which is going to be data IO. So if you hear me using those interchangeably, they are one in the same. MetCalcPy and MetPlotPy. And uh, so let's start with the data DB side. Get rid of this. Let's see. My apologies. Okay, so um, I know this has been mentioned numerous times throughout the workshop, but Data IO is going to be the new name. And right now, if you look at the GitHub repository, um, which is located here at uh, the DT, DT Center uh, GitHub.com link, it is still Data DB and will be until definitely until the 2.0 major release perhaps the beta and the next beta release no guarantees but definitely for the 2.0 and then we have the uh, data db read the docs um, and that basically gives you instructions on how to get started to install things uh, we do need to fill in the documentation for that a bit more so that you know which package uh, which modules have what what methods that you can use and in, in, import but basically, it's used for loading data into the database for MetViewer. Um, and, it, and, and also, I think MetExpress Met, Met might start using it as well. Uh, it's a general input output, and it's, and it's expanding to doing input and output for other things. So that's why we're changing the name to Data IO, because it's, it's, uh, the role has expanded from just doing database loading. So I just talked about that. And two, the two major uh, modules for right now that, that's in data IO or data DB, net data DB, are the read NC, the net read NC, and the net DB load. And we created a read NC to facilitate uh, reading in net CDF files and putting them into a Python data structure that can then be readily used by MetCalcPy and MetPlotPy and, and other people too who might want to to reuse some of the data IO features. And then the MetDB load is what we originally started with, um, and it has a lot of uh, features for uh, loading in things um, from the data to the database. Um, and then the next uh, next piece is MetCalcPy, the next part of the next component. And here's the link to the repository. Again, it's these are all in the the public GitHub repositories under the DT Center uh, location. And we have a MetCalpy user's guide. Again, it uh, basically, it gives instructions on how to get started, what pieces of, or what third party Python packages you need. Um, and again, it needs to, it, it, there are a lot of functions and, and methods in the MetCalpy repo. We just uh, need to get around to fleshing out the documentation a little bit more so you know which uh, what's available for you. But we do uh, use the Python documentation in the code, so you can always use that for now. Um, so 
this has grown in scope as well. First, it started out for using uh, for calculating statistics that you could then use for other things like Metplotlib. And then it's grown into providing some pre-processing support, diagnostics, and then we have some reusable utilities that are used across the MetCalPy um, usage or whatever the, 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 the eco ecosystem. And then uh, we have, since these three components are the latest, MetDataDB, MetCalPy, and MetPlotPy are the latest additions to the MetPlus family, we are, we are at the latest uh, release is 1.1.0, so we're really new to the block. And uh, our development began with Python 3.6, and so starting with this current development cycle, which is we're working on uh, version 2.0, we just did a beta 1 release, that is now, uh, we've migrated to Python 3.8. Um, so just a heads up. And uh, CalPy is used in NetViewer, MetPlotPy, some MetPlus use case, uh, use cases, I also call them, and I believe um, Molly is now starting to use some MetCalPy, and she's going to be contributing to MetCalPy based on Met MetExpress uses. Uh, this can be important. For the most part, you can tr you can think of MetCalPy as a collection of modules that you can import, but we have some modules that can be run standalone and that are invoked by Java mainly because of NetViewer, which is written in Java. And uh, we have posted the, these on the PyPI, the Python Packaging Index, so you can do a pip install if, you're, if your work uh, workflow is using a Conda environment. You can do a, met install, uh, a pip install of MetCalPy, and the latest version is 1.1.0. You can also, if you want, the 1.0.0 is available too. Um, you can also install other versions like the development or beta versions by uh, locally by just cloning the current the repository and the branch that you want and do a pip install dash e dot don't forget the dot when that just means it, you want it locally and e means it's editable so any kind of changes that you make so when you do a uh, when we do a refresh of the the your check your your clone it'll it will automatically uh, update that. And then um, um, you run that, uh, you, you just do that pip install uh, command line from a command uh, from the command line where your MetCalPy root directory is. So just look for that setup.py file and, and that's where you want to run that. All right, so next is, uh, let's talk about the repository layout. So we have, uh, one, two, three. So we have a, we, we are doing a little bit of housekeeping and doing a little bit of reorganization. And we used to originally just dump everything into util or just the, the root directory. And now we've added a contributed section, a diagnostic section, uh, a pre-processing. There was always a util. And then we have other things that are under the root. So the things that are under the root were currently um, primarily used for NetViewer. So that's the, the, the huge the, the like, majority of the code in MetCalPy was used, is used for MetViewer. And lately, with the contributed uh, code we've been receiving from the Naval Research Lab, NOAA, uh, University of Illinois series, and some other NCAR entities, uh, diagnostics we have reserved for any future diagnostics tools, which again are coming from some external contributors. Pre-processing is for any Pre-processing processing of any input, and then util is anything that we can reuse for a lot of the MetCalPy, other MetCalPy uh, tools. And then, uh, so here's here's how you can see how MetCalPy is used. So I think I showed this, I stole this slide and put it in one of my slide decks yesterday. But for instance, the rock diagram uses the uh, MetCalPy util um, CTC and PSTD statistics to handle some of the PCT and CTC line type data. And so you would import it like you would any other module and then invoke it. And uh, again, we will try our best to fill it, flesh out the uh, documentation so it's a little more clear what does what so that you know what, uh, where to focus your uh, attention when you want to uh, figure out how to use the CalcPy um, methods. 
All right, so now let's move on to Metplotpy. And so Metplotpy, um, these plots are all in Python. And as Tara mentioned earlier, uh, the, originally the MetViewer plots were written in R. And so we spent a considerable amount of time and effort converting those R scripts into Python. And so some of uh, so a lot of these plots are available in NetViewer, and there are some examples in the Netplus wrappers use cases for um, running uh, or that that use these NetPlotPy uh, plots. And so they're basically scripts to generate plots. So you wouldn't necessarily uh, you wouldn't import them like you did with MetCalPy or MetDataDB. So we have uh, contributed plots as well as the MetViewer plots, and uh, you can run them uh, from the command line. So they can be run standalone. So when we say standalone, that's what we mean. It does, however, require MetCalPy, uh, and so you can, you, can use, you can do a couple of things. You can either clone the repository or use pip install, which I mentioned in a previous slide for MetCalPy. Um, Again, uh, just like with MetCalpy and MetDataDB, MetDataIO, we originally did our development in Python 3.6 for versions 1.0 and 1.1. Uh, Python 3.6 was end of life, so that forces us to move to Python 3.8. So all of the de development is in Python 3.8 from here on out. And then um, a little uh, talk about the repository layout. Uh, here's the repository. Again, go to the github.com B2 Center uh, location and you'll find the Metplotpy repository there. You can go to the read the docs to get instructions on how to generate these plots. Uh, so the contributed plots um, come from wherever. Some of them are not necessarily from, from external sources. Some of them predate the Metplotpy repository. So uh, they might have come from earlier work uh, the that viewer plots are usually in that metplotpy, metplotpy plots area. So when you come into the, when you uh, enter that, that URL into your web browser, you're usually dumped to this page, which shows the main, the latest uh, main um, or major release. And in this case, it's V11. And then you'll see that it's basically a simple layout. Um, you it takes you to the metplotpy, metplotpy directory, and you have two, two modules, the contributed and the plots. So metplotpy is run with configuration files. And so we use, uh, we use YAML files. Uh, so you'll see things that have either have a .yml or a .yaml uh, um, um, extension on it. And we require two configuration files. We have a default configuration file, which we always have for you. It's automatically added, so you don't need to worry about providing one. And then for all of the plots, we also provide a custom configuration file. You can create your own. Um, um, but uh, this is how the uh, MetViewer type plots are, are run. We have those two configuration files. Now there is a caveat, the contributed plots, since they come from all over the place, don't always follow this paradigm. So you will definitely need to refer to the user's guide to make sure you know how to generate those plots because they have different configuration file structures and um, so they don't always follow what MetViewer does. So here's our list of best practices, if it's possible. Um, some folks don't have the permissions to do so, but if you can, we recommend that you run with an Aconda environment so that you can have the correct or the appropriate version of Python and all the third, the concurrent third party libraries installed in a safe place for you to reuse. Um, while you're reading the instructions, you might think they're a bit odd, but they are designed to work for those folks who don't have permissions to modify the source code. So some people have source code that is downloaded in a common area and they're supposed to work from there. So that's why we recommend that you create a working directory and copy your custom config files and your input data files there and work from there. So uh, we have things set up so that you need to set three environment variables, um, a Python path, 
because you are installing sometimes MetData DB and MetCalc Pi in addition to Met uh, in, in addition to your MetPlotPy. You need the MetPlotPy base so that you know where your MetPlotPy source code is located, and the working directory, which points to where you're you're putting your input data, output data, and all of your custom config files. So what you would do is you would copy your data and custom config files to that working directory, and from there you would edit your custom config file. Oops, yeah, all right, yes. So uh, what I wanted to do is I wanted, I like the Windows plot because it's really pretty, and it follows the NetViewer paradigm of using two config files. It's currently not available in NetViewer, uh, so that I, that's why I thought it would be kind of fun to show how to, how to create that. So uh, what we have is, for this guy, we have the custom config file. They're all located in that metplotpy plots config directory, and they're always named by the plot, the plot type, underscore defaults, and then YAML. And you can, if you're a contributor, it doesn't matter if it's .yml or .yml. Y-A-M-L, it'll, you know, it, the, the code will pick, that, pick up the differences. Um, it's, uh, and of course, it's not currently available in NetViewer, but uh, maybe one day it will be incorporated. But in the uh, default config file, we set things like the plot file name and, uh, the, and uh, marker colors, uh, the, the location of the sample input data, Angular settings, things that you would normally want to customize. Um, so we have those default values set. So they're so just in case it is ready to to be incorporated into Met Viewer. Mena, you have just a couple minutes. Oh, thank you. Yikes. Okay. Um, so what you need to what you need for running these and other uh, this and other uh, MetPlotPy uh, plots is where the data resides, and we always put our data under the MetPlotPy test under the name of the uh, the, the plot type. And in this case, it's a matched pair text file from running uh, Met point stats. Then the custom config file, which is also in the MetPlotPy test directory. And then you need to know what the Python script, uh, and that's in the MetPlotPy plots Windrows directory. And then so you would set those, uh, uh, those um, environment variables that I mentioned, the MetPlotPy base, the Python path, and the working directory. You would modify that Windrose custom configuration file to point to where your working director, uh, to where your, um, where, where your uh, input data is located and where you want your output data. Um, and then you would run uh, from the command line that Python, the, uh, the bottom, bottom bullet, that Python, um, you call Python and then the, the name of the Windrose.py plot. And then the and just indicate the custom config file. So those are the, the things that you need: Python, the name of the plot, and then the custom config file. And so when you're all done, you should come up with something that looks kind of like this, unless you modify the name of the title, then you'll have something different. All right. Thank you for sitting through all of that. Um, sorry I had to rush through that. There's a lot of stuff to go through. Uh, but uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to entertain any of those. That was a great presentation, and uh, lots of material there. So, ah, we have a question for Molly. Hey, um, good talk. Out of curiosity, does the um, uh, uh, Python 3.8 compatibility exist in a beta release currently, or is it not going to be until the, the 2.0 release? Right now, it is in the beta 1 release. So from here on out, we've, we've kind of work through painfully all the 3.8.6, to be precise, uh, compatibility issues with third-party Python um, packages. So yeah. OK, thank you. Yeah. Thank and you just are. a warning, when you're making such a big leap from 3.6 to 3.8.6, you will find a lot of deprecation warnings and future warnings Yeah. third-party libraries. I'm just asking because. Uh, Med Express is being built with 3.8 already, and it would be, since I'm about to start working on that, it would be great to not have to mix and match. Python can be a challenge with different versions and dependencies. A few <laughs> times. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so we have a question in the chat from Marion. Can you see that, Meta? Uh, okay, I'm going to go ahead and read it for those folks who 
so we have access to it. She says, am I right in understanding that the data required for plotting must be in the same directory subtree? Is that practical long-term that locations are very much? Oh, no, uh, you don't have to. Uh, that's why we recommend for best practices, you create a working directory. And so you can put that working directory wherever you're, you have permissions and uh, put the data wherever. So just uh, set that environment variable and. Okay. Thanks. I thought yeah. I misunderstood, but I was just checking. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. No, uh, and it's thanks to the NOAA NCO folks for helping us make sure that this was um, runnable for, for all of those people who have constraints. Yeah, thanks. Cheers. What are the chains? Um, so I, oh, okay, there we go. Yes. Okay. So Russell, I, it says, I may have missed this earlier in the workshop, but are there any plans to make Metcalf Pi and other Python med modules from Met available on Conda channels? Um, well, I have, uh, I don't know how to get stuff into Conda. I've just played around with getting stuff into PIP. So I'm still looking into that. If you know how to get stuff into Conda channels, please send me an email. <laughs> I would be happy, more than happy to get CalPy and, and DataDB. That's the next thing I need to do. I need to get DataDB into PIP, the, or not PIP, Py, PyPI, the Python package index. Sure, yeah, I, I know just enough about Conda to know that it's not trivial to, to get those things set up. So um, yeah, thanks for that answer. Yeah, so unfortunately you'll have to do your Conda installs first and then you can do your PIP install at the very end. And I think we better move on. I did see another one in the chat. Maybe you can respond in chat to that one, Meta. And yes. then we'll, we'll move on to our last speaker of the session. So, Dan, are you here? Hi, Keith. I'm here, yes. So we have another NCAR RAL uh, member of the team, Dan Adriatson. I pronounced your name right. So yeah, that's good. You are going to talk about Python embedding. So this is a little bit different than the other topics, and it's uh, quite important. So take it away, Dan. OK, great. Um, can everyone see that in full screen mode OK? Looks good. OK, thanks, Keith. Um, yeah, as, as Keith said, I'm Dan Adrianson. Um, I'm a scientist that works on the Met Plus development team at NCAR. Um, and, um, you know, Python is, is something I have a big interest in and enjoy working on. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the Python embedding capability, um, within that plus. So just a little bit of an overview slide, I guess, sort of like a pump you up slide, so to speak, is, um, just a little bit of review of what the power of this Python embedding capability, uh, can, can sort of, um, enable you to do as a user. Um, it, it really opens the door to support uh, kind of endless file formats um, to use with MET um, and MET Plus, um, provided that you, the user, have a way to read the data with Python. Um, historically, uh, I believe MET development um, has uh, sort of prioritized file format support on a, a as needed basis or when critical mass was assumed, but uh, this sort of capability allows um, users of any numbers um, to be able to support file formats, even if it's just a proprietary file format that only they uh, use or their company or, or institution uses. Um, I think Tara mentioned this earlier in the session, um, but another big uh, uh, advantage to this capability is it allows a user to perform data manipulation excuse me, data manipulation prior to calling the MET tools. Um, so I list through three things here, data cleaning, uh, data formatting, and um, derivations or, or calculations, creating derivative fields from, um, say, a model NWP forecast or something like that. Um, one thing I've also found with, with Python embedding that's, that's a little bit of an advantage in my opinion is it uh, sometimes reduces or eliminates uh, intermediate data files on disk. You'll see in the example in this talk that um, one uh, 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 example of this is when you run ASCII to NC, um, ASCII to NC takes 
uh, ASCII data and writes out a net CDF file to disk uh, where you're working and then is read uh, downstream by other MET tools. Um, with Python embedding, you can actually read your ASCII data with Python and hand off the data in memory to the MET tools downstream uh, without needing to write it um, to a net CDF file on disk. Um, and of course, uh, the, the, perhaps the biggest advantage uh, of all uh, to this capability is it connects MET Plus um, to the Python ecosystem so you get access to popular packages like X-Ray and Pandas for data manipulation. Um, you know, there, there's MetPy out there, uh, which does a lot of uh, meteorological derivations that can be used um, and, and so on. Um, there are lots uh, that, I, that I don't have enough time to mention. Um, so. We'll just go through a simple example um, to kind of highlight how the capability works in, in its most simple application. Um, there are uh, far more complex examples, um, but just due to time, I'm, I'm going to just uh, choose the ASCII to NC Python embedding example to review um, to sort of demonstrate how the capability works. Um, so in this example, um, which is a demonstration of the ASCII to NC with Python embedding MET plus use case, which I've linked to here in this slide. Um, Python replaces reading and formatting actions that usually occur within ASCII to NC uh, to create a MET uh, point data 11 column format uh, net CDF files. So in this case, the Python embedding is actually writing a net CDF file, um, but uh, We'll look at we'll look at a, a, a more typical workflow later on that where that doesn't occur. So for this particular use case, there's three Met Plus configuration items. I've highlighted them here in cyan in the capital letters. Um, there's ASCII to NC input format, which is set to Python. Uh, the ASCII to NC input template is a string um, encapsulated in quotes, where you have the path to your Python embedding script and then a path to the input file that is read by the Python script. And then the ASCII to NC output template is the path to the NetCDF file that's, uh, that's written. Um, that's the MET plus wrappers uh, configuration items that are set. Um, but for those of you who uh, use the ASCII to NC tool by hand quite frequently, I've also included the uh, MET translation of the command line uh, uh, version of using ASCII to NC uh, standalone um, with Python embedding at the bottom, just for comparison. So here's a little bit of graphical demonstration, and I'll go through sort of what the Python embedding is doing when you run this uh, use case. Um, so Met Plus uh, starts up ASCII to NC, um, which actually uh, short circuits and runs your Python script. And inside the Python script, uh, in this use case, it's reading ASCII data. It's a space delimited uh, ASCII file, but it could be other data um, into Python. Uh, it, it uses the pandas read CSV method to create a data, uh, pandas data frame. And then that data frame is converted into a uh, Python list that has the name point data, which is required. And we'll talk about the requirements in a, in a few slides. Um, and then it hands off uh, the data back to ASCII to NC, which does the writing to NetCDF. Um, so again, um, this is this most simplistic uh, example uh, to just sort of demonstrate how this all is wired together. Um, and these two graphics uh, visualize how this works um, without Python embedding. Uh, ASCII to NC starts, it reads the data, and it writes the NetCDF um, with this Python embedding. Uh, ASCII to, or excuse me, MET plus uh, starts up ASCII to NC, which runs the Python script, which then passes the data back to NC for writing to NetCDF. I note in the lower right that um, in this case, uh, it's ASCII data, but it's generically point data, really. Um, it could be HDF, NetCDF, CSV, or some other uh, format uh, if needed. So let's take a look at the actual Python script that's being called here and what's going on inside of it. And I understand that the diagram is small. I don't intend for you to be able to read the actual code that's, that's in that example. Um, a couple important things from this slide. Um, the script that's actually being initiated lives in the MET installation directory. So in the MET scripts Python directory, there's a script called read ascii point.py. 
and that's what this uh, image shows is, is an image of that uh, code snippet. Um, this script is a great template um, to start from. So if, if you're going to do your own Python embedding, which we'll talk about in a slide or two, um, I highly recommend um, using one of these uh, template scripts that comes with a Met installation as a jumping off point um, because it handles a lot of how your data need to be named and other sorts of uh, requirements uh, that the Met tools necessitate. Um, so you don't have to cross-reference to documentation and write that all yourself. So in the red uh, block here, um, in this particular script, it contains also a handy reference to the 11 column uh, format that Met expects, uh, which is a requirement for your point data to be able to hand off uh, to downstream tools. So again, uh, starting with these uh, scripts that are included with the Met installation is not only handy from a code standpoint, but it includes um, uh, a quick reference to, to sort of what the columns are named and their data types. Um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, this example is just using a simple space delimited ASCII file. So the read CSV uh, method from pandas, uh, the Python pandas package is being used to create a data frame. Um, but as I mentioned in the previous slide, note that the final object that's actually being handed off uh, back to the MET tool in memory is a Python list. That's the object that's, that, that needs to be created from your point data. Um, and it must have the name point underscore data. Um, that's, that's what's being looked for um, uh, by the MET software downstream. So I have this slide. I, I sort of I gave it away a little earlier. Do you really need ASCII to NC in this case? Well, not really, because the Python script is just reading data and then passing it back to ASCII to NC, which is writing out an FCDF file. So again, it's the most simplistic example um, I could sort of come up with, but arguably it might even be a little bit confusing because it's so simple. Um, and really, in this case, you should really only use this uh, ASCII to NC example if you really need a net CDF file in the 11 column format uh, to be written out. Um, you know, the, the more realistic point obs workflow I've, I've highlighted in the lower right would be that MetPlus starts up and a, a Python script is used to read some point data that you have, and it takes that point data and it passes it. Uh, in the uh, 11 column uh, format Python list as a surrogate to PointStat, and then some uh, verification is performed, and then PointStat writes out the output. Um, so, in a typical MET workflow, here you'd have ASCII to NC, you'd write the net CDF file to disk, and then you would call PointStat and point to the net CDF file, but it's sort of encapsulated all in the Python uh, handoff step here. Uh, just this, this is probably more a more realistic uh, application of a Python effect. Um, and I just have this uh, graphic here uh, that shows your Python script sort of sits between your data set and uh, the, the stat tools in this particular case. So what if you want to write your own Python embedding script? How would you get started? Um, this is sort of just a, a really high level overview of how I would approach it. Um, but I would really encourage you to read um, the MET documentation, um, in particular Appendix F, which I've linked to here in the second bullet, um, because there's some nuances about controlling your Python installation, what version of Python MET is built against, and, and other uh, really uh, technical details that are described there that, that are, are really too in depth for this presentation. So. If you're interested in writing your own Python embedding script, this is how I'd approach it. I'd first review um, the sample Python embedding scripts that come with the MET installation. Again, those are in MET scripts Python. Uh, I just looked, and I think with the latest release, there's about 10 or 12 scripts. Um, so there are a variety of different uh, uh, jumping off points you could use from uh, 2D gridded data uh, in a NumPy ND array to point data uh, using Pandas data frame to uh, some HDF data, I think, from one of the use cases that we have. Um, so just, just to give you a sample of, of sort of the, the different things you could start with. Then um, after you've sort of reviewed what's available and what might apply to your, app, or to your um, specific case, uh, then go ahead and review the MET documentation for Python embedding, and that's in Appendix F. A lot of critical information in there. 
and it, it's really detailed and, and really comprehensive. Um, it should answer most questions uh, for, for most all applications. And then um, if you have gridded data, you can use a NumPy ND array or an X-Array data array object. Um, note that Python embedding right now only supports 2D planes of data. Um, so you can't uh, read, say, like a, a isobaric temperature field um, on pressure levels uh, from 1,000 to 50 millibars or something and pass it into to an else tool. Um, the ND array or data array must be named metdata, and it must have the required attributes assigned to it. And again, I'll refer you to Appendix F. All of these uh, details are, are described there. Um, for point data, um, you have to use a Python list named point underscore data, and it has to be in the MET 11 column format. I've linked to the MET documentation that describes that in case you need a quick reference when you're doing the slides. Um, you don't have to use pandas to do this, but I find it really easy to use pandas data frames because the data frame object in pandas has a, a method attached to it to convert it to a Python list automatically. Um, so you don't have to construct a an 11 column nested list by by hand in Python, which which is kind of tedious. Um, and then lastly, what I would do is click the the link here at the bottom, which is to find a Met plus use case um, to model how you're actually going to call your Python embedding script, because it does vary based on the tool that you're using. Um, and you know the Met plus configuration option that you need might be called something different depending on where your Python embedding script sits in your uh, MET tool, uh, MET plus workflow that you're constructing. So um, a summary of a Python embedding with MET plus. Um, this is a unique uh, customizable entry point for all users of the MET tools. Um, and it's supported in MET plus via the MET plus wrappers. And also you can use it directly on the command line with the MET tools. Um, I link here again to the MET plus Python embedding use cases because there's uh, a wide variety of uh, very simplistic to very complex uh, Python embedding examples. Uh, and we really encourage users to leverage this capability for whatever your workflow uh, might be. Um, and I link here to GitHub discussions and would encourage uh, anyone with questions setting up their own Python embedding uh, script or getting it to work in their workflow or switching to Python embedding or adding it uh, we, we welcome any discussions there and kind of are happy to help. So with that, I'll say thanks. And um, I hopefully left a little bit of time for questions um, because there may be some. I'm happy to answer any. I'll try to get out of full screen chat. Thanks, Dan. That was a very interesting talk. I appreciate that. So we yeah. do have time for a few questions. So um, like with the other speakers, go ahead and raise your electronic hand or type it in the chat. And Dan will be happy to answer those. So I'm not seeing any so far. Just reading, there's a couple questions in the chat. Um, yeah, I don't see any any hands raised either. So if there's no, uh, nobody with a question, I'll okay. read the first, Go. the first one. Um, I thought you had mentioned earlier in your talk that you can avoid writing out separate NetCDF files to disk but rather use the data directly in memory by MetPlus. Can I, can I clarify? Um, yeah, so, so the Python embedding should hand off the data in memory. Um, you know, you, you read it in with Python and the handoff occurs in memory to the Met tool. Um, the specific example I chose was, I think, a little bit confusing because the example was actually writing out a NetCDF file. That was the result of the demonstration that I had chosen to, to talk about. Um, so hopefully that clarifies it. Uh, if not, feel free to jump in, unmute, jump in, or, or respond in the chat. I'll check again in a minute if, if that's, uh, that's still confusing. Um, and then one more question. I have a gridded analysis in a non-CF compliant NetCDF pile produced by a MetPy interpolation script. Can Python embedding convert that file into a CF compliant NetCDF file for ingest into MetGridStat? Um, so my answer to this question would be that you may try running your MetPy interpolation routine on your data 
which returns in theory a variable in Python, and then trying to send that directly downstream to the MET tool without writing the non-CF compliant NetCDF file. Um, and this may require just some um, uh, manipulation of what your variable is named that's returned from the MetPy interpolation routine and also ensuring that that variable has the required attributes. So for example, if the MetPy interpolation routine returns an X array data array, uh, you just need to make sure that that data array has the required attributes that MET requires and has the required name. And then you can call that Python script, provided MetPy is also installed in the version of Python that you're using for MET and for your Python embedding, which will call MetPy, do the interpolation, assign the attributes, and call your MET tool, all without writing the, the file to disk. Hopefully that, that clarifies it a little bit. If not, feel free to jump in. Um, uh, yeah, this is uh, John Raby here, Army Research Laboratory. And my question was aimed at a situation where I'm trying to actually write out the net CDF file, and then, uh, ingest it into MET separately. So if I avoid or don't use that module, which writes out the net CDF file, somehow then the data, the grid and analysis product itself, before being put into net CDF, is able to be directed for ingest into the MET grid step before actually writing out some kind of a net CDF file. Is that what you mean? Well, I mean, yeah, you, you can, yeah, you can redirect the the output of the interpolation routine in MetPy towards your MET tool and probably still use Python to write the non-CF compliant NetCDF file if you need that for, for other applications. Am I understanding correctly or, or still confused? No, it sounded like you captured it really well. So I appreciate okay. you addressing that. Yeah. yeah, and if you know if you try to implement something like this, or you're you know you, you you try to take your script that does the interpolation and plug in some Python embedding, you're running any trouble, feel free to reach out. Um, we're happy to help uh, get get you going. Thank you. And be sure to check the chat. John HG just put put uh, a link in there for you. Thanks, John so, HG. So thanks, Dan, and thanks to all the speakers. We're at the end of the session, so I think we had a, a, a really interesting set of uh, talks, and uh, I certainly learned some things. We have a lot of exciting tools, and uh, the project is, is, is always adding things. So uh, Tara, do you have some closing remarks? Um, yeah, I do. I just wanted to point out that um, tomorrow, uh, you know, we'll be starting at the same time um and we're we'll um it's actually going to be a a shorter day um so in the morning uh we will um be looking at uh the use of met plus for um ensemble and tropical cyclone verification we will also have a help desk running concurrently so um I, it looked like nobody really took advantage of the help desk this afternoon but that's okay um, if you um, think of questions that you'd like to ask at a help desk, um, we will have that running concurrently. Um, and then after a break, um, then it's when we get leave to hear from all of you um, with regards to, you know, future needs. And the, the categories, um, once again, are, um, you know, like cutting edge, new novel verification topics, how to handle unstructured gr grids, um, you know, how to, to weave our way through um, you know, the R2O process, looking at operational needs and research needs, looking at process-oriented or phenomena-based diagnostics, or, um, you know, just gathering up all the other miscellaneous ideas. So um, when we're done with that, we will have a um, report out from those breakout groups, um, and then a final wrap-up and, and um, question and, and answer. So uh, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Um, I am going to be sending out links to um, two Slidos um, overnight so that you can be adding answering questions like how we can make it easier to set up config files correctly as well as um, you know documentation the um, the, the top the, the third um, uh, barrier to entry for MET plus was um, missing or um, confusing or um, you know uh, not clear um, uh, documentation so just looking for some um, ideas on uh, how you feel 
um, we could improve upon those. So look for those in, in uh, an email coming out later today. So thank you very much and see you tomorrow. Bye all. Thank you. Thank you.